Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said leave them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to begin a, a new series on today. And um, I want to use 1 Corinthians 11 as a, as a starting text. And uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Again, verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. The Apostle Paul here is um, addressing reports that he has received regarding the saints at Corinth, that there were divisions among them. And uh, we would think that upon hearing these reports that the Apostle Paul would be surprised, shocked, um, but he wasn't. He may have been displeased, but he certainly wasn't surprised because, again, we see in verse 19, he says these divisions, these uh, schisms, these conflicts, these heresies, they must be. They must come. They must come. Uh, Jesus says something very similar to this in Matthew 18. I want us to look at that. Look at Matthew chapter 18. They must come. Uh, these conflicts must come. Here in, in Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 7. Matthew 18 and, and verse 7, and it reads, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be, notice, it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offenses cometh. Jesus says they, it must be, these offenses must be, Mark chapter 13, one more, one more verse, Mark chapter 13 and verse 7, Mark chapter 13 and verse 7, Notice it reads, and when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, be not surprised, for such things, notice, must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Again and again, we hear um, and we read in, in Scripture that... Uh, the things that are contrary to our peace, things that are even contrary to our safety, whether it's conflicts, wars, schisms, offenses, the Bible again and again says that these things must happen. In other words, they are necessary. They are necessary. And, and that's what I want to talk to you today about I want to talk to you from the subject, necessary evils. Necessary evils. Um, you probably heard that expression before. It seems like an oxymoron, but it is not. And we're going to um, talk to you about that, you know, beginning today, that there are necessary evils. In other words, there are things in life. There are things that we might consider harmful things that we might consider hurtful, things that we might consider evil that the Bible says are both needful and necessary. You know, it's, it's hard for us, I think, many times to wrap our minds around that idea that Paul 
that Christ would say that these things that we would consider dangerous, harmful, troubling, they must be. They are necessary. And the question that comes in our mind is why? Why are they necessary? Well, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 11, turn back to our passage in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19, Paul tells us why they are necessary, why they must come. Again, verse 19, and it reads, For there must be also heresies among you, watch, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest. In other words, God uses offenses, he uses trouble, uh, he uses uh, evil and the like in order to reveal or to make manifest those who are approved of God. This is God's way of revealing those who are approved. And what, is, what, is, what does the Bible mean when he says those who are approved of God? I want to give you a definition here. The word approved here in verse 19 is from the Greek word dokimos. And it means to be accepted or to be proven genuine or authentic. To be accepted, to be proven to be genuine or authentic. The fact of the matter is, I know we don't like to say this, but there are a lot of fake Christians in the world. Christians who are not authentic Christians who are not genuine, and they're mixed in among those who are. And God uses the trouble, he uses offenses, he uses uh, uh, calamity, he uses all sorts of evils, quote unquote, in order to show, reveal, prove, test who are the true Christians from the fake ones. And that's what we want to talk to you today about. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. It's a, another a wonderful passage um, that we see here, Matthew 13. There are a lot of fake Christians, again, pretending to be saints. You may have met some. You may have met some. You, you may be one. I may be one. There's no way to know without these, these, these evils that the Bible talks about. Evils have a way, the, the calamity, the trouble that we experience in life have a way of revealing or, or distinguishing the true, the genuine, from the false. Here in Matthew 13, beginning at verse 24, this is a parable that Jesus spake here in verse 24. It reads, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30. Let them both grow together. Notice, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So again, again, here in this parable, we would normally expect the landowner, when he learned that there were tares sown among the wheat, that he would be surprised, that uh, he would be angered. He would be eager to do everything he could to remove the tares from the wheat, but we don't see that. Instead, Jesus says he allows both the tares, that is the fake wheat, to grow alongside the genuine, authentic wheat that he had sown. 
from his good seed. Let them both grow together. How long? He says, till the harvest. Look at verse 39, for instance. Verse 39. He says, the enemy that sold them is the devil. So here Jesus is given an explanation of the parable. He says, the enemy in the parable is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Let's look at verse 41. The son of man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. What I want you to see is that God has ordained a time to remove the tares, remove those who are not genuine Christians from out of the kingdom. But notice when that time is in the end of the world. It seems that everybody, uh, it seems that the church, it seems that Christians, it seems that the people in the world, it seems that everybody except for God is eager to remove all of their problems, all of their issues, all of the evil from their life. God's not so eager. And you want to know why? It's because he understands something that we don't. That the evils, the, the, the things that we see in our life that we want God to, to remove so desperately is actually working to prove and to reveal, to make known who are approved of God. Those who are genuine and authentic Christians. Now, what I want to do today and, and the lessons after this is to begin to talk about what are those evils? What are those things that God allows to continue in the world? What are those things that God allows to continue in our lives that help to reveal, that help to make manifest uh, those who are approved of God? What are these evils? And uh, one of these necessary evils, that's what we're calling this message, one of the necessary evils is difficulty and trouble. Difficulty and trouble. We all know we're familiar with difficulty. We're familiar with trouble. But God says this is a necessary evil because it reveals the sons of God. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. Necessary evils. The first one we're going to talk about, again, is difficulty and trouble. Matthew 4 and 1. And it reads, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Let's read that again. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, here in Matthew chapter 4, we have... Um, a description of the temptations of Christ. And we're all, many of us have read this, these passages regarding Christ's temptation from the devil, or we've heard sermons on them. But what, but what we often miss is the fact that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. You know, these temptations from the devil weren't just coincidences. He didn't just wander into them. He was led by the Spirit into these temptations. And why was he led by the Spirit? It's to teach us that these temptations that Christ experienced were necessary. They were ordained of God and they were necessary. They were necessary. And one of the first temptations <clears throat> that, the dev that the devil that came against Jesus, that the devil launched against Christ, came in a form of a challenge, a challenge in which the devil challenged whether or not he was truly the son of God. See, this is what we're saying today. We're saying that these, the trouble, the difficulty in our life is to reveal or to test whether or not we're genuinely sons of God. And this is exactly what this temptation that Christ experienced was intended to prove. Was Jesus truly the Son of God? And this is the first challenge we see. Look at verse 3 of Matthew 4. 
Verse 3, it says, and when the tempter came to him, came to Jesus, he said, notice, if you be the son of God, notice the challenge. If you truly are the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, then don't you deserve uh, to, to, to eat why are you starving? God is going to supply all of your needs according to his riches. Why are you sitting here starving? So if you're truly the son of God, turn this situation into one in which it is benefiting you. It is benefiting you. And this is what we often do as, as Christians. I, I hear, I've heard many Christians saying, you've probably heard them too. I'm a child of God. Therefore, I deserve to ride in the best. I deserve to wear the best. I deserve to live in the best. I deserve to have the best. But notice here when we read of Jesus, he says that the devil is challenging him with the same thing. Aren't you the son of God? Don't you deserve to have the best? I believe we're coming to a time real soon where the true sons of God are not going to be determined or seen or revealed by how we live, by how we drive and, and what we experience in life is going to be determined by how well we obey and take heed to the word of God. And this is what Jesus says. Look at verse four, verse four of Matthew four, four and four. He says, and he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice Jesus didn't quote some prosperity verse and saying, yeah, you're right. The Bible does say I'm supposed to have the best. You know what Jesus said? He countered the enemy. He says to truly be a son of God is not determined by if I'm eating bread, but it's by whether or not I'm living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Out of the mouth of God. Now, when we hear that, when we hear Jesus say that, it kind of sounds, I don't know about you, to me, it kind of sounds like Jesus was saying, well, I don't, I don't need to eat. I don't really need any food. All I need is the Bible. You give me the Bible and I'll be fine and I can go uh, for the rest of my life on just reading the word of God. That's not exactly what he's saying. In fact, Jesus is, is quoting from a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 8. So let's turn over there real quick. To Deuteronomy chapter 8. He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And um, we're going to look at verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. What does he mean by that? Well, in Deuteronomy 8 and 3, notice it reads, and this is Moses, he's speaking to the people, to the Israelites. He says, and he humbled thee, meaning God humbled them and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live again he said he suffered thee to hunger so that he would make you to know that man we could say that the sons of God do not live by bread only but by every word that proceedeth out of the out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live the Israelites here he's Again, Moses is speaking to him. He's reminding them that you survived 40 years in the wilderness, not because of your toil, not because of your hard work, not because of your efforts, but you survived 40 years in the wilderness because you took heed to God's word. If you remember the story of the Israelites, God fed them with manna, but he specifically told them, that this manna would only appear in the morning 
and you would have to gather it every day. That is, if you gathered enough for two days, it would spoil. You had to go out every morning, gather it, turn it into bread, and the next morning you had to go out and gather it and turn it into bread. Now, if you went out in the evening, the, the manna wouldn't be there. If you try to gather it, as I said, uh, uh, two days so you can sleep in the next day, it would breed worms. You had to, they had to obey God's word every day, get up, do what he had told them to do, and they survived, they ate, they were fed, and he caused them to live 40 years while they were taking heed to his word. It wasn't their efforts. They weren't planting in the wilderness. They, 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 they weren't harvesting in the wilderness. They didn't eat because of the sweat of their brow. They ate because they obeyed God's word. And that's the point that Jesus is making. And so this lesson is teaching us that man is not sustained by his efforts, whether or not he turns his stones into bread, but man is sustained by taking heed to the word of God. It seems that so many Christians, so many of us are eager to turn our stones, our difficulties, our trials, the things that we are experiencing in life that are in lack, to turn these stones into bread, to fix our problems, to take matters in our own hands. But how many of us are eager to take heed to the word of God? It seems this is, this is how we feel like we are proving whether or not we are Christian. In fact, this is how we look at other people, determine whether or not, are you, do you true, are you truly walking with God? Are you uh, fixing your problems and performing miracles? Oh, you can't get a prayer through. Oh, you know, you, you can't get any miracles worked in your life. Look at what you're still experiencing, which, what you're still suffering. And many of us feel, feel bad that as a believer, as a Christian, if we're not able to fix our problems, if we're not able to, to turn the tide in our condition, that there must be something wrong with our relationship with God. But your relationship with God, what determines whether or not you are a true child of God, son of God, is not determined by whether or not you turn all your difficulties into, into bread, all your stones into bread, fix all your problems. What is the true sign that you are a son of God is that you take heed to his word, every word that come out of his mouth. And I'll tell you this, if you obey God's word, you won't lack anything. It might seem that way. You might feel like you're coming to the end. But if you obey God, he will make sure your needs are met. And there are many of us, many of you who are experiencing lack in your finances, a lack in your relationships, lack in your physical body, and you're wondering, how do I fix this problem? You don't have to fix the problem. Notice, the Son of God didn't try to fix all his problems. You know what he did? He tried to make sure he kept obeying God's word. He says, this is how I'm going to live. This is how I'm going to thrive. And this is how your marriage is going to live. This is how your finances is going to live. This is how your body physically is going to live by obeying the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter seven. It seems that some of us are more eager. I want to want you to listen to me. It seems that some of us are more eager, more hungry to perform some work for God than they are to obey God. This is what we have reduced Christianity to, the works we do, the things we do. And there are so many in the body of Christ are eager to do some mighty work for God, more so than being eager and hungry to obey and take heed to the words that comes out of his mouth. And I'm going to tell you, you know, what um, reveals or proves uh, authentic Christianity is not the works we do for God. What proves authentic Christianity is our obedience. Here in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, let's begin in verse 22. Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. We could say, have we not in thy name turned our stones into bread? Verse 23, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, what? You that work iniquity. God is less interested in children who are working than he is in children who are obeying. He says, those who work iniquity, even though you've done many wonderful works for me, will be separated from him in the end at the harvest. They are the tares. They are the phony, the fraudulent, the fake Christians. The true people of God are those who obey God at all times, even difficult times. And this is what God sometimes, why he brings difficult times to our life, why he brings trouble to our life, to see if we will still obey him when things get difficult. Because that's the sign of true Christianity, a true Christianity. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. These things must come. These things must come. I know many of us are eager and many of us have been praying, Lord, remove, as, as Paul prayed, remove this thorn from me. No, it's necessary. He's going to many times keep those things there or keep us in the fire because that's how he is determining, proving, testing our genuine Christianity, our genuine uh, sonship whether or not we are truly sons of God, those who obey his every command. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. I want you to notice what, how Paul begins this list in 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse 1 again. He says, perilous times or difficult times. Times. That's what the word perilous means. Difficult times, notice, shall come. And that's what we've been talking to you about. How there are times when difficulty is necessary. There are times when trouble is necessary. There are times when evil is necessary. We were wondering, man, why does it seem like everything is going the opposite way? Why does it seem that there is a decline? It is necessary. It shall come. It must come. Difficulties in our life, difficulties in our world, difficulties in our country, in our cities, in our streets, in our communities are necessary. Because through them, God is proving who are approved, who are the genuine article who are practicing authentic Christianity and notice Paul says here in in verse 5 that during these difficult times he says in verse 5 some will have a form of godliness but deny the power there they have a form of godliness this word form it is taken from the Greek word morphosis 
This word form is taken from the Greek word morphosis, and it means to have the features, to have the features or the appearance of a thing. So when Paul says you, they have the form of godliness, they have the features of godliness. They have the appearance of God. They look like they are saints. They look like the genuine article. But they are not. They lack the power. They lack the essence. And this is what we're seeing today. So many in the body of Christ um, have reduced godliness down to a form. Down to a mere appearance. I remember when I was growing up that you could uh, you could tell or if you want it to appear, I should say, if you wanted to appear that you were godly, that you were, you know, serious about God, then you could see it in the way um, uh, people were dressed. They would have long dresses on, carry big Bibles. Men would have short hair. You know, th this was our way of of showing people, giving people the appearance that uh, we were not of the world, but that we were for God. That was just an appearance. We, we, it took us a while to figure that out, but we finally figured out that our sanctification, you know, our holiness was not found in our dress. Uh, I remember when I, I was out, for instance, just as a side note, we we were out at a at a church convention in another state, and uh, a bunch of us were at a restaurant. You could tell that many of those us who had been at the uh, the church convention was at the restaurant because we were all dressed in our church clothes. And uh, someone came up to me, and uh, it was someone that was not a part of our group or part of our church. And I was like, "Oh, where are you guys coming from? A wedding or funeral?" <laughs> you know. And he was like, "No." Um, uh, we're, we're coming from church, and, um, and um, this person was asking someone else in my group, you know, so what kind of church is it? And uh, they told them it's, it's a sanctified church. And uh, they looked at them like, oh, what's sanctified? What does that mean? And uh, they began to tell them, well, sanctified means that, you know, we don't, we, 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 we don't wear pants, and uh, we, we don't cuss, we don't smoke, and we... And uh, we, we don't we don't go to the club and, um, you know, we we wear our dresses, you know, they, they begin. In, in other words, they began to list a bunch of appearances, appearances of what sanctification is. And as I said, it took us some time to realize that that having the appearance of sanctification didn't make you sanctified. But today, believe it or not. There's still this appearance, you know, there are pe people still, you know, faking Christianity or faking that they are serious for God. Only today, godliness or the appearance of godliness isn't seen by the clothes we wear, that, we're, that we wear. Instead, today, godliness is seen uh, by how active we are in ministry. Yeah, you, you know, if you want to give people the impression or the appearance that you're serious for God and serious, we like to say serious for the kingdom. You know, I'm, I'm not interested in religion. I'm interested in relationship. I'm, I'm about kingdom work. So if you want to give people the impression that you're really serious about kingdom work, that you're really godliness, then you will begin to show them and explain to them how active you are, whether in your community active in ministry, and, and in other words, Christianity or godliness has gone from the appearance of what we wear to an appearance of how we operate in ministry. You know, you, you see, you this church, oh man, this church, those people are on fire for God. Look at everything they're doing. Look at everything they're doing. Look how active everybody is. Or, or everybody is operating in their spiritual gift or uh, this church has the whole five fold ministry gifts and operations. And, and so we feel like, oh, man, we're really doing it for God. This is a real godly environment. But in many cases, it's just an appearance. It's no different, believe it or not, than the long dresses, the big Bibles that we used to carry. 
Because what I want you to see is that godliness isn't found not only in your dress, neither is it found by how active you are. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is a big problem, saints. This is a big problem. You, you got Christians claiming to be um, um, all about the kingdom. But soon as difficulties show up, then they start acting like the devil. I, th I thought you were godly. I, I thought, man, you guys were doing it. That's because godliness, true Christianity, a true child of God isn't seen by whether or not they're performing miracles or they're operating in, in five-fold ministry. It's silly. True Christianity isn't seen in any of that. And this is what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9. And listen, I'm not I'm not discouraging people from operating in 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 the gifts of the spirit or in in the, the gift that God has appointed to every believer. I'm saying simply operating in a spiritual gift does not make one godly. One of the churches. The, the one church in the New Testament that had all the gifts in operation, the Corinthian church, they were the most carnal church. Paul says you come behind in no gift, meaning everyone in that church was baptized in the spirit, speaking in tongues, working miracles, walking in their spiritual gift. But he told them all that they were all carnal and walk like mere men. They, they, they weren't being authentic Christians. Here in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receiveth a prize. So run that you may obtain. He says, everybody's running. Oh, man, everybody's running. The church down the street, they're running. Everybody's running. You Christians, every, who's a, everybody's a Christian and everybody's running. He says, everyone runs in the race, but only one's going to receive the prize. Just because you're running, just because you're active, just because you're moving, just because you're, you're not idle doesn't mean that you're running for God. You could be running for your own ambition. Everybody running a race, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. Jump down, verse 26. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. So fight I, not as one that, what? Beateth the air. You know, listen to me. There are a lot of Christians out there that look like prize fighters, you know. You know, sometimes, I, you know, when my wife's not looking, my kid's not looking, I, I'll get in front of the mirror and act like I'm, you know, like I'm a prize fighter. Oh, boy, I could get in the ring with Mike Tyson. Anybody can look like a prize fighter when there's no enemy in front of them, when you're beating the air. And this is what Paul is saying. He says there's a whole lot of people swinging. There's a whole lot of people looking like prize fighters, but everybody's not getting the prize. Do you know every boxer who trains in the gym, those even that look like prize fighters, they, some of them never get the prize. They never win the belt. Uh, the, the sports team that gets off the bus, you know, they oh, look how tall they are, man. Those guys, man, they're going to they're going to sweep the floor with this other team. They look great. But they don't get the prize because you don't get the prize because you look good. Because you're beating the air, Paul says. He says here that the battle is is not against the air, you know. You got to make sure that what you're swinging at is the thing that's going to win you the prize. You know, we live in a time where everybody wants to be an activist. Everybody wants to take up the fight of poverty. Everybody wants to take up the fight of unlawful imprisonment. Everybody wants to take up the fight of crime. And, and when I say everybody, most of these people coming out of church that the church we have now, all, all of our fighting now is, is, is for social issues. We're, we're fighting to win this, fighting to win that, fighting to win this. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you, you can fight to win those things. 
But number one, as we said today, those things will always be here till the end. <laughs> They're going to be here. Number two, just winning the fight over poverty, winning the fight over crime does not put you in the kingdom. Winning the fight against these things, you know what puts you in the kingdom? Look at verse 27. Look at what verse 27. He says, but I keep my body under. I bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a what? Cast away. Notice what Paul was fighting. He wasn't just fighting the air. He, he wasn't just fighting social issues. He was beating his body, keeping his flesh under. He says, why? He says, because I could preach I could preach to others and I myself will be a castle. See, you can operate in your fivefold ministry gift and still miss God and be a castaway. You know what the word castaway is? This word castaway is an interesting word. It's from the Greek word adakimos, adakimos. And it's the exact opposite of the word approved or adakimos. Did you remember when we said at the beginning that the, the, the evils that are happening in our life are necessary to show those who are approved, dokimos, those who are genuine, authentic, uh, true Christians? Well, he says here, Paul says here that if you don't keep your body under, even if you're operating in your spiritual gift, even if you're preaching, you know, everybody wants to be a preacher. And so you, we, we love it when, oh, man, we're empowering everybody to preach. Well, that's not going to get people in the kingdom. Preaching the gospel isn't going to get them there. What we, what we also need to remember is that unless you keep your body under, you will be a castaway. That is, you will be a dokimos, meaning you will be cast away, proven to be fraudulent or fake. That's what the word a dokimos means. It means to be proven fraudulent, bogus, phony. There's a lot of phony Christians. There's a lot of fake Christians. Even those who are performing miracles. Even those who are who are doing many wonderful works. They're phony because they don't keep their bodies under. They're phony because in times of difficulty, they act out in the flesh rather than crucifying their flesh. They're phony Instead of obeying God in difficult times, they take matters in their own hands and try to turn their own stones into bread. They're phony. They, they, they go around uh, 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 quoting the scripture, saying all these things, having, having a, a Facebook visual video post while they're driving and talking about all these great things, preaching to, to countless people over the Internet. But soon as trouble comes. Soon as difficulty comes, rather than standing in the word, rather than doing what the Bible says, rather than trusting and waiting on God to bring an answer and correct the issue, they take matters in their own hands and try to fix their problem. You know. And Paul says, let's be careful that, it, that we don't run this race and we never accomplish the purpose why we began to run in the beginning. Remember, the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith that you may lay hold on to a position. No, eternal life. Eternal life. I don't care how many people you win to the Lord. If you don't win your own soul, it's going to be for nothing. In these last days, there are going to be many phony and fraudulent Christians operating and looking like the church. Let me warn you, saints. Don't be deceived. There will be, Jesus says in that day, there will be many Christs. There will be many Christs. Many people operating like they are the true church, like they are Christ himself. But they are phony and they are fake. You do not determine a genuine Christian by what they do. You determine a genuine Christian by who they are. 
who they are. Do you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Meaning, do you realize that your life is sustained? Your relationships are sustained. Your finances are sustained. Your physical body is sustained because you obey every word God speaks to you. That's your key. Not getting more classes to figure out, okay, how can I conquer this? How can I be better? You know, get better at obedience and you'll find. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness and watch this. All these things will be added. See, we are filling up all the empty spaces in our, in our churches with different classes for everything. To, to try to teach people how to, um, how, to, how, how to perfect every area of their life when they, when they won't obey God. He says, if you just obey God, and th this is why I believe, me personally, God took us on this quarantine and sent us home. Because too many in the body of Christ were eager to do work for him and not enough were eager to take heed to his word. So he sends everybody home, nobody do nothing and learn to obey. Because that's one thing you could do at home. Obey. Obey. Oh, Pastor, we need to do something. We need to get out there in the street. No, you need to obey first. Get that together. Because you can only give what you have. Jesus, he didn't come out the womb preaching. 30 years he spent developing, the Bible says, growing in favor and in wisdom with God and men. Why? Because you can't give what you're not. Not just what you don't have, what you're not. Be something before you try to give something. Jesus says, he says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall say a witness, give a witness. No, be a witness. Be a light, be salt. We're, we, we are, we are, I think we're, we're, we are, we are so obsessed with training people. And, and we're not as eager to disciple them into somebody. Stop, because you can train a pig to do, you can train a horse to do anything. You need to be converted. That's a mark of true Christianity. All this other stuff, is, it, it's the form. Yes, should we be doing these things? Should we be in our communities? Should we be making a difference? Yes, but that's just the form. If we're not that on the inside, if we're not Christ on the inside, what good is it? We're just beating the air. We're beating. We will never get the prize for it. We will never be rewarded for it. Like I said, we're, this is, we're living in a day. The last thing is going to be many phony. And they are right now phony Christians, phony churches. Because they're only operating in a form of godliness. Their godliness isn't authentic. Why? Because they don't understand that the evils that come in their lives are necessary to train and prove and test what they really are. We should be embracing these things. We should expect them. You know, all these verses, they shall come. They must expect it. Expect trouble. Expect difficulty. I didn't say expect to fail. I didn't say expect to, to be defeated. I said expect trouble because it's coming to test. The true church, the true saints will go through the fire, go through the valley and come out as pure goat. They will be proven to be dakimos, to be genuine, to be authentic. And everyone else will be proven false. You, you can't tell the Christian by what they say. Everybody's got the, everybody talks a good game. Sounds great. You can't, you can't tell by the way they look. Everybody looking sharp. Everybody, you know, you can't tell by what they do. Everybody's working. Everybody's involved. You know, we, we done broke this thing down so, so well in our training that you really don't even have to be saved to be operating in ministry. In fact, we'll take people right off the street and stick them in ministry, put them over stuff. And we call it God. You know, some of this stuff don't take an anointing. 
It just takes training. You know, you go to enough classes, spend enough money in schools, you, you'll figure out how to do anything, even church work. But I tell you what you can't learn in no classroom is how to obey God. That only comes through fire. That only comes through trial. That only comes through difficulty. And those of you out there feel like second class citizens because you're not doing what your neighbor is doing. Don't worry about that. That's, there are many running, but everybody's not going to receive a prize. And you know, one of the greatest lessons I learned when I entered into ministry is stop being eager to do stuff. Just be somebody. Because when you're ready, God will send you. God knows where to find you. You know, you're so eager to create plans and try to do this. Don't do any of that. You know what you need to do? Get ready. Get saved. Sanctify yourself. Cleanse yourself. Be ready and he will find you. He'll find you. He'll put you in place. This is the best thing you could be doing. I know some of you feel bad because you're not in church and you're, you're not working on, in your ministry. And, oh, I haven't been in my, I haven't been on my post. Maybe you need to be off your post for a little while so you can get the right thing in you. What you're doing right here, listening to the word, uh, uh, meditating on the word, uh, using this as an opportunity to be a doer, of the, this is the best thing you could be doing. The best. I want to pray for you today. Bow your heads with me. Father, we do thank you for uh, this word. We thank you for the opportunity to share it with your people. And we know, Lord, we are living in difficult and perilous times. Things are difficult all around us. And we are tempted, persuaded by the enemy, by our own passions to act apart from you, to take matters in our own hands, to try to use our rights and our privileges as sons and children of God in order to bring correction to everything in our life. But maybe, just maybe, what we need to do is learn to be still and learn to trust you through these things, knowing that the trying of our faith worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed. I pray, Father God, that we would take full advantage of of these lessons that you are providing us through our trouble and our difficulty, that we would resist the urge to try to act apart from your leading and your guidance, and that we would learn to cast our cares upon you and trust in you. I pray for the saints under the sound of my voice that they would be more eager uh, to be perfected than they are to perform some great work for you. Lord, sanctify them through the water of your word. Cleanse them and prepare them. Make them ready for whatever move you bring into the earth in these last days. Father, again, I thank you for these things. I give you praise in all glory and all honor. Amen. Give me what and to amen. Say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love.